40 years ago, I started a company that designs and manufactures products that automate research laboratories and factories. And almost every day for 40 years, I interacted with manufacturing engineers and research scientists in thousands of different organizations. In fact, I have profited from carbon. For example, I sold approximately $5 million worth of the device shown here to the petroleum industry. And I actually like what carbon has done for our society. If it wasn't for carbon, we and our cities would not be here. Also, carbon's place in history will eventually come to an end, like the sun setting on a hot summer day. Three years ago, I awoke one morning with an epiphany. I felt my life was meaningless. I was tired of chasing money as an entrepreneur, and I instead wanted to help the planet. And I thought about how my background was unique. I had a lot of experience with manufacturing, engineering, and energy. And so I started a nonprofit with some friends of mine called the Manhattan Two Project, and I sponsored and managed 25 university R&D students, and I published 30 articles on climate change solutions. I've probably published more than anybody else on the electronic industry on this topic. And the most interesting graph, in my opinion, with respect to climate change, is the US government's projection of CO2 emissions from the US over the next 30 years. And as one can see, the US is not decarbonizing. And this is due to the fact that our economic strategy is fundamentally flawed and our political strategy is fundamentally flawed. And I'll talk about that more in a moment. Also shown in the graph is a green line that indicates what it would look like to decarbonize at a constant rate over 30 years. And this talk is about that green line. The US emits 5 billion tons of CO2 each year, and if you reduce this to over 30 years to zero, then you'd have to reduce it by 170 million tons a year because 5 billion divided by 30 years is 170 million. And a big question is, how much does the green line cost? Well, in a typical case, the cost to reduce CO2 is about $40 a ton. So if you reduce 170 million tons, that would cost $7 billion. And you can take the $7 billion and divide by the 300 million population and get $20, which is the cost per American. And that would be for the first year. Also, it goes up $20 a year. So the American would have to pay $40 in year two, $60 in year three. And this shows up as an increase in the cost of goods and services. Another question is, if you're doing the green line, what's an example of a federal law that implements that at lowest cost? You need a law with two provisions. Provision one would require that electricity decarbonize at 6% a year for nine years. And provision two would set up a new decarbonization laboratory that reduces decarbonization costs. So right now, the United States has 38% of its electricity that's generated without emitting CO2. And if you increase this 6% a year, then 44% would be green after the first year, and 50% would be green after the second year. The green line has two parts. The first part, the first nine years, is achieved with electricity decarbonization. We know how to do that. The costs are reasonable. And then the second part is 21 years, and that's cost reduced with R&D during the first nine years. Our current economic decarbonization strategy is to encourage individuals, companies, citizen states to reduce CO2. And at first glance, this may seem reasonable. However, it is fundamentally wrong. And the reason is these entities rarely have the ability to decarbonize at lowest cost. This is like asking the city mayor to build a car from scratch in the local shop. Sure, he can do it, but factory mass production is a lot less expensive. Another example is, imagine you've got a million houses and you want to put 20 solar panels on each of these. You incur project overhead costs a million times. This is very expensive. Alternatively, if you put 20 million panels out at a solar farm, you don't see overhead every 20 panels. And this is why the cost per unit of electricity at a solar farm is three times better than residential solar. Now let's talk about climate change politics. There are two types of regions. There's those that produce and export a carbon-based fuel and those that import. You could think of these as fuel exporters and fuel importers. And with climate change politics, you only need to know one thing, and that is that a fuel exporter will not politically support eliminating that fuel. 
If you understand this, you'll understand what's happening with climate change politics, and you'll understand how to fix it. The maps shown here indicate where fuels are produced in the United States. Fortunately, two-thirds of the states do not produce natural gas or coal. The exporters are hurt by decarbonization. The opposite is true for the importers. The importers benefit in two ways. The importers gain local green jobs when they build local solar farms and local wind farms, and the coal jobs are lost elsewhere. And the importers also benefit when decarbonization causes less consumption of fuel to lead to excess supply, which drops fuel price, and then they end up paying less for fuel. The existing decarbonization legislation in the United States has been put together by a political coalition of environmentalists, the labor unions, and the auto industry, and this has mostly helped labor and auto. Instead, to decarbonize at lowest cost, you need a political coalition that benefits from lowest cost decarbonization. That's not auto or labor. That would be the two-thirds of the states that import carbon-based fuel. When there's a problem, you typically have somebody who's tasked with resolving it in some way. And when we formed the Manhattan Two Project three years ago, we noticed nobody seems to be taking responsibility for the whole problem. So we decided we would do that. We'll be responsible for the whole thing, that we will own this problem. Now, one might think that's a little crazy or overly burdensome, but that's not the case. It just means we do research on how to solve the climate change problem at lowest cost and in a way that's politically feasible. And we've taken the results of all our research and consolidated it into a book called A Plan to Save the Planet. And this is available via electronic media for free. So if you go to manhattan2.org, click on a link, you'll get a PDF file of the book at no charge. And you don't need to register, you don't have to put in your email address. And so if you just want to see, let's say, the first chapter, it's five pages just to see what it's about, it's very easy to do so. The first chapter talks about how to do the green line at lowest cost. The third chapter talks about how much the green line costs. Fourth chapter talks about how to set up a research laboratory. Much of the book involves R&D. For example, chapter 17 talks about how to improve nuclear fission power to the extent required by the public, and chapter 18 talks about how to accelerate the development of nuclear fusion power. Climate change is likely to cost the world $100 trillion. Therefore, it's reasonable to spend additional money on R&D to reduce that cost. All of our files are open source, which means anybody can copy and modify and rename at no charge. So this means that if you don't like our plan to save the planet, and you want to take what we've done and improve it, you're welcome to do so. You can save the planet, too. Also, if you're wealthy and you want to save the planet, consider setting up a decarbonization R&D laboratory that reduces the cost of decarbonization. To do this, you would need a business plan. And to get started, you're welcome to copy and modify any of our 34 chapters, many of which involve R&D. When putting together a plan, one typically will take a problem and divide it into some component parts, put together a solution for each, and then make sure each solution is feasible. With climate change, this involves putting together an economic strategy, political strategy, and a technical strategy. An economic strategy looks at how to fix this at lowest cost. A political strategy entails identifying a group of people with at least 51% support in government, who benefit from lowest cost decarbonization. And technical strategy looks at all the different things you can do with R&D to reduce decarbonization costs. The world has not had a plan to save the planet in the past, and this has led to wasted time and wasted money. They teach in business school and engineering school, always begin with plan. We should apply this to climate change. Thank you.